<laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to this special webinar, How Rodents Are Threatening Your Food Safety Procedures, with, uh, as you can see there, Shell Hartzer from Orkin. Hi, Shell. Hello. Nice to have you with us today. Um, just to say to the audience, uh, it is being recorded today, so if you do miss a bit, don't worry. Uh, uh, follow up afterwards with the slides and the recording. Um, so, yeah, shall we get the slides up and then uh, just go straight into the presentation? Sure. Uh, okay, I'll be back for the uh, Q&A later, ladies and gents, but for now I'll, I'll hand you over to Shell. All right. Thank you, folks, so much for being here. I really appreciate all of all of your time to do this. And we are, of course, talking about rodents today. There are a number of pests that, of course, can be in in facilities. But we're going to focus kind of just on the just on some of the common rodents. And I know we may have some international folks on, uh, so I'm going to try and talk as general as I can. But but please do realize that that I'm located in in the United States, so I'm I'm a little biased uh, with what I deal with. Uh, but we are going to talk about the threats of, of, of things to look for. And then, of course, you know, what to do about it. Um, just knowing that there's a pest there, we, we do want to do something about that. So we're going to talk all of those things. Because rodents can be a very big threat. When you look at just rodents as, as overall, the, the breeding potential is pretty incredible. When you consider a house mouse, a single female house mouse can have five to six pups in every litter, and she can have six to 10 litters per year. You have one single female mouse that can produce 60 additional mice in a single year. And of course, while that's happening, they're then reaching maturity and doing the same thing. So uh, Norway rats, same thing. We can have eight to nine pups in each litter, um, breeding about four times a year. So uh, again, that that potential for growth when they're left unchecked with enough food, water, and shelter is, is really big. Obviously, a number of diseases that we're going to talk a little bit about, and, and, and your reputation. Uh, think of going to your favorite restaurant and uh, you know looking on, on the online reviews on Facebook or Yelp or whatever you're looking at, and somebody saying, ew, I saw a rodent run through. Um, that doesn't encourage you to eat at that place. Same thing for food facilities, whether that's a warehouse or processing. You do not want that ruining your reputation, whether that's with an end customer or suppliers, receivers, anything like that. Um, when we talk about the contamination that they can cause, uh, right now, hantavirus uh, was a couple years ago in our national parks in the United States. A few people died from hantavirus, which is transmitted by deer mice. Right now in California, they're having a, an issue with marine typhus, which is actually spread by the, the insects, the, the fleas and ticks that can be on the rats. But all of these things are, are a big issue that could potentially be in in the facility, even bubonic plague. I mean, we think back to the, the plague being something from the Middle Ages and doesn't exist anymore, but in the United States alone, we have an average of eight cases of bubonic plague a year. Other places in the world, even more than that. So these are all things that rodents can carry, that can you know, affect us as people. And of course, we're talking food here, um, whether that's a food warehouse, food distribution center, food processing, um, raw ingredients, finished ingredients. Rodents can eat that. They want the food that we have. And it's not just the direct feeding that they're doing the damage of. Um, any of you folks that, that work in these industries know that if you have a pallet of food and you see some rodent feeding on a corner of that pallet, it's not just that one box or that one bag at that corner of that pallet. It's the entire pallet that's now contaminated and needs to be disposed of. So that, that almost secondary damage of just the damage of being around them and the food around them that can potentially be contaminated is really important to consider, not just that direct feeding. And of course, the damage to structures. Since rodents are constantly chewing on things, uh, they can obviously chew through your structure itself. 
Um, a lot of issues with rodents chewing on wiring. Uh, there was a statistic out in the United States that about 20% of fires of unknown causes they suspect are caused by rodents chewing on wires. And once they do that, the live wires can start a fire. So we have not just the structural damage, but fire damage that's a potential. All of these things from a rodent potentially being in or around your facility. We talked a little bit about this already, uh, um, about the bubonic plague. Um, I want to say that in 2017, which is last year, the Center for Disease Control has statistics on there were five cases in the United States. Uh, but just on June 3rd in California, a girl was diagnosed with rat bite fever. So these diseases are, are still out there. Food poisoning is a big one, um, especially, again, considering the, the food industry that most of you are war working in. Rodents have the ability to pick up pieces of contaminated food, pieces of contaminated stuff, bring it around with them, drop it in another area. So just imagine a, a rat running through an area that's contaminated with salmonella and then running into another area of your warehouse, rubbing up against something else, rubbing up against a pallet of food, rubbing up against a, a piece of food contact surface. And what you have then is that now they've deposited those particles. So now you have salmonella spreading through a facility. So as scary as this is, this is why we want to manage these things. This is why we want to prevent them. Because again, that reputational threat. Um, today, it takes nothing for a picture to be posted on the internet for somebody to say, ew, just saw a rat in a grocery store. Uh, I did some quick Googling yesterday, and one of the first things that popped up is that Buckingham Palace is having an issue with rats. Um, I, I know that's not you know, a, a spot that a lot of us are, are going to be able to visit in the next couple of weeks or anything, but um, still imagine that. Uh, this, the very second thing that came up on my news feed was garbage and rats are infesting LA's fashion district. So all of these things, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a, a popular tourist destination, or whether it's your food facility, your reputation is on the line. Um, it may be from an audit, again, it may be a supplier, it may be somebody who's receiving your goods. You don't want that affecting your reputation. So this is why pest management is so important to keep these things in check, keep them outside, keep them managed. So we talk about what to look for here. Obviously, if you can see the rat, um, that's, that's a good first sign. You know, if you see the rodent running through, you know you probably have a rodent issue. But we're also looking for a lot of secondary things. We're looking for, for some of these, these secondary conditions that, that might be leaving behind. Obviously, the droppings. Believe it or not, a house mouse will leave behind about 100 droppings per day. So imagine a mouse running through your, your facility and 100 times they're gonna stop and they're gonna drop a, a, a pellet. And again, the contamination issue from that, of that spreading around. Um, nesting is a big issue. House mouse like to nest inside where they can find that area. Roof rats are going to nest up high, a lot of times in trees outside of facilities, but then come inside. Uh, but those Norway rats, they like to burrow, and they're going to burrow right up next to a building if you let them and find those pathways in underneath a facility and get in that way. Um, if you have a heavy rodent infestation, you'll notice these real dark marks, these, these oil marks, these rub marks along the pathways that you're using because rats are, for lack of a better term, kind of greasy. They're a little bit dirty. Uh, that grease protects them from a lot of things, but it's also going to rub off on the walls and the corners that they're running around. So. Uh, again, if you think that you have an issue, you know, looking for some of those dark rub marks is a great way to, to start pinpointing some areas. Of course, if you can see them chewing on stuff, whether that's boxes or pallets or 
parts of this structure, again, pipes, their teeth are very strong and constantly going. So they have that constant need to gnaw on stuff. And, and rodents are also nibblers. They don't eat a lot at any one time. They're gonna nibble a little bit here, go on to the next spot, nibble a little bit there, a little bit over here, a little bit over there. So looking for those, those nibble marks too of food that they're starting to eat. Again, I already mentioned those burrows that the Norway rats are going to do. And again, if they can burrow underneath the facility and find access that way, they absolutely will. So as I said, you know, the, the obvious sign uh, of a rodent is going to be the rodent itself. We do want to identify what kind of rodent we're dealing with. And again, in the United States, our three most common pest species are going to be the house mouse, the Norway rat, and the roof rat. Obviously, if you're somewhere else in the world, you may have some different rodents that are bigger problems than these. But these are the ones I'm going to focus on uh, for this particular one. Remember that whatever rodent you're dealing with, that identification is important because whatever it is, it gives you a place to start. If you know that you're dealing with Norway rats, you know to start looking for burrows. You know to start looking downwards versus if you've got roof rats, you know to start looking up. You need to start looking high, looking at high trees, high power lines. Uh, what does your roof line look like? So by identifying which pests you are dealing with, this is where you start to narrow down some of those areas where they might be more common in. You don't have to waste your time in a big, huge warehouse if you know that that one tree on that one side is probably what's allowing that roof rat in. Um, so this can save you a little bit of time and, and again, focus your efforts. Uh, one more fun fact about our rodents are our rats, the Norway rat and roof rat, uh, especially the Norway rat, are very good swimmers. Uh, I saw a statistic the other day that Norway rats can actually tread water for three days. That's pretty amazing when you think of, uh, of how versatile these animals are and how good they are at doing what they need to do. So uh, again, depending on, on where you are, figure out what your pest species are because from there you're going to develop this integrated management plan. Um, this integrated plan is going to use all the tools that we can, uh, again, focusing on rodents for this particular uh, talk, but this should be an all-encompassing plan that looks at all of the past. And what IPM aims to do is it aims to prevent a lot of these problems. Um, we want to make sure that we keep those rats on the outside where they belong. We want to make sure that the mice don't have access points to get in. If we can keep them out of our warehouse, our food processing facility, our storage site, what we do then is, is move the problem farther away, that we don't have that problem inside now. So IPM is really about preventing these problems and preventing the problems from getting worse. A lot of times we, we know from being in these facilities that we have these pests out there. It is inevitable that something is going to happen at some point in time. So preventing these problems from getting worse when they do happen, catching them quickly and using a lot of tools that we have instead of letting that problem continue to get worse and worse. If you remember, I said that that one house mouse can have up to 60 babies in one year. We don't want to let it go one year. We want to prevent that from getting worse from the day one that that mouse gets in. So when we think about IPM programs, IPM plans, it's not just treating the symptom. It's not just treating it once it happens inside. It's about looking for some of those root causes and trying to prevent those, as well as then using all the tools that we have in our arsenal to deal with that. And as I said here, you know, that root cause, trying to trace this back, this is, this is about putting on your detective hat and, and trying to find out what caused it in the first place and can you solve that initial point um, or, or some points along the way to make this a lot less of an issue. And I know that many of you may have a, a third party that comes in and actually does most of your pest management work, but everybody within your facility, everybody within that building still has a part to play. We just talked about all the, the things that you can look for that are evidence of rodents. 
think of how many staff members you have in your facility and using every single one of their sets of eyes. If they know what to look for, again, we talk about preventing these problems from getting worse. If you know on day one that a roof rat came in through a specific skylight in your facility because one of your employees saw that, you can deal with that problem quickly and effectively. So use all of your employees. Let them know what to look for. Let them know those signs. Obviously, seeing that rodent is a perfect sign, but some of those other things that may show up as well. Um, your IPM plan should identify the types of pests that are going to be common to your facility and some of that history as well. If you know the history of what happened last year and the year before and knowing that in the, in the fall that you're going to have more rodent pressure because all of the rodents are trying to move in from those colder areas outside to those warmer areas inside, Again, you can anticipate for some of that and prevent some of those problems. I know I'm going to keep repeating the word prevent all the way through this, but that's what it is. We want to prevent some of these problems, prevent them from getting worse. And so if we can address them early, address them when they are still small, it makes them a lot easier to deal with. So your IPM plan is going to focus on, on inspection and sanitation, which again can, can be used to manage a lot of these issues. And if we can prevent these issues from happening in the first place, that's let's be honest, that's fewer shutdowns. That's a lot more runtime, which is something that most facilities want. So when you think of your pest management program, even if you have that third party who's coming in once a week or more often, maybe a little less often, they're doing that, they're doing their part, but you still have a part to play in that, as does everybody else in your facility. So by working together, it's, it's a great way to keep these issues manageable. Because we do want solutions for this. And when we think of these solutions for long term, it is about going back to that root cause. How are they getting in? Where are they coming from? All living things need food, water, and shelter. And rodents are no different. They're looking for food, water, and shelter. And unfortunately for many of us and, and for these three species, we provide that for them. In our food facilities, it's, it's awful hard to eliminate all the food when you are producing food. Um, so your inspection should look at some of those areas that you can control. Uh, dumpsters are a big one. Uh, can you move those dumpsters maybe a little bit farther away from your facility and, and make them not overgrown with trees and close them up so the rodents have a little bit harder time getting into them? Uh, can you look at your the outside and seal up any holes, seal up any areas that they may be using to get in? Um, so that inspection portion is really important, but it's also challenging because let's be honest, some of these some of your facilities are are very big facilities, and so that's a lot to look at. Again, this is where you can bring in every single employee that you have. Uh, they know the areas that they work in. They know the problems that are there. Talk to them. Give them, give them a source that they can report these issues so that you find that door gap before a rodent can get in, so that you find that dumpster that's not closing properly and you can close it properly. So again, use those employees when it comes to that and, and use their eyes because they are a great inspection tool as well as your pest management professional, again, if you have a third party, and whoever is, is doing these inspections. Because what goes along with inspections is looking for these sanitation issues. As I said, all living things need food, water, and shelter. So we've discussed the shelter part. Your entire facility is probably a very nice shelter for them, and your facility probably provides a good amount of food. Um, so that's hard to clean up. And when we talk about sanitation, it's not always about cleaning up every single piece of food because, again, we all know that that's impossible to do. But can we limit the amount and the access of food that these rodents have? Can we put that food behind a locked door? Can we put that food in a package that would prevent rodents from chewing through it? Um, you can see from the top picture that the pallets uh, raise the food above the floor, which makes it 
just a little bit harder to get to and it makes the inspection a lot easier as well. So we've done two things here. We've put the food a little bit farther away and we've made it easier to inspect so that if something does pop up, we can catch it quickly. But it's those hard to reach areas that are always a big challenge. So again, using your employees, teaching all the employees of the facility the importance of sanitation. I mean, we all think sanitation, yeah, we should keep things clean and you know, clean out the refrigerator every so often and mop the floors and you know, clean out that piece of equipment. But when you stress that this is also for pest management, that we're preventing these rodents from getting to this food source and we're not allowing them to have the food, what that does is that stresses out their population. I always like to say, especially, um, it's a little after lunchtime for me here, so I just had lunch, I'm, I'm nice and full, but if somebody brought in a dozen chocolate chip cookies, I'd be happy, I'd have tons of chocolate chip cookies, I'd have more than enough food, I'd be happy, but what happens now if somebody only brings in one chocolate chip cookie and they lock it in the desk drawer that's, that's three doors down from me? It's gonna be a lot harder for me to get to that food. I'm gonna have to spend a lot of time and energy getting to that food, which means I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time and energy finding a mate. I'm not gonna be reproducing very quickly. I'm not gonna be growing very quickly. So when you think of sanitation within your facility, don't always think of cleaning up every last food particle. Think of limiting the amount and the access. Cleaning up those spills quickly when they do happen and trying to contain that food that you do have in a way that makes it a lot harder for the rodents and the other pests to get there. Um, it's, it is tricky. Um, I, I tend to joke sometimes that sanitation is easy. All you have to do is clean everything up. But that also makes sanitation very, very challenging because there is no way to clean up everything, especially when we're dealing with food. But when we're talking about some of those other things as well, not just the food sources, uh, we wanna remove some of that clutter as well. Rodents like overgrown spots. Those, those overgrown spots are safe to them. There's no predators there because they're closed up. There's a lot of clutter there. there there's no room for a predator to get into them. So when we look at this picture here, again, a lot of cardboard, uh, a lot of areas that they can hide in that people aren't, aren't there. They're not disturbing them. So this is a great location for them. In many facilities that I'm in, uh, I can usually find what I, what I like to term a graveyard. Um, it's a graveyard of old equipment, old boxes, old something. Almost every facility has one of these. It's, it's just that, that spot where all the old stuff just kind of gets dumped. And these are great areas for pests, especially rodents, because they're undisturbed, so the rodents can nest in them, the rodents have a safe spot, they can raise their family, and then they've got easy access to the food nearby. So check out these graveyards. Check out these areas that you have that are overgrown. And don't forget the outside. Um, you know, I, I talk about overgrown areas, you know, when we talk about this cardboard piling up and this old equipment. But remember, a lot of our pest issues start on the outside. And when we let those pest populations build up and up and up on the outside, the likelihood of them getting inside your facility increases. So look on the outside as well. Make sure your trees, your shrubs, all your vegetation is trimmed back. You want to make sure that there's, there's this... Uh, vegetation free border around your site that you can literally walk right next to your building and and not have to touch a plant make sure your trees are trimmed back so that they're not touching the roof lines so those roof rats don't have easy access all of these things on the outside again help reduce those populations on the outside so fewer of them even have the chance to get inside. So sanitation is not just the inside of your facility, it's not just the food source. Sanitation is also that clutter, that harborage point, and definitely the outside. And when we talk about the outside, that food source as well, especially dumpsters, employee areas are another big one. So check all those areas that should follow an inspection plan as well. Your outside should be inspected for all of these sanitation issues as well. And then we talk about, well, like I've said, keeping them on the outside. Um, let's be honest, rodents are out there. 
Um, so what can we do to keep them out there and keep them from getting inside and using the food, the harborage, the water that's inside our facility? And I kind of like to refer to this as, as the rule of thumb. So if you hold out your thumb and your thumb can fit into one of those openings, a full-grown rat can get in. If you hold out your pinky finger and you can fit your pinky finger into a, into a space a full-grown mouse can get in. So think of the rule of thumb when you're looking around at your building and those cracks, those crevices, those spots around your building, underneath doorways, around windows, any of those things. If you can fit your thumb in there, a full-grown rat is gonna be able to get in. If you can fit your pinky finger in there, a full-grown mouse is going to get in. And we typically do a, a fairly good job with walking around the building, especially if you have that vegetation-free border. You've got good visual of what's going on. I think one of the things that a lot of folks forget about is the roof line. Um, a lot of these facilities have HVAC systems, um, air conditioning units, heating units, a lot of vents are all up on the roof. And so if a, if a roof rat or, or even sometimes Norway rats will climb pretty well, can get access to that, if you have these openings on your roof, that's one way that they will gain access. Um, I remember I had one facility that had a roof rat that, that kept getting in and they, they knew it wasn't nesting inside. And, and so we sat there and we waited and we watched this one specific area and we watched the roof rat climb up the tree, go over the tree onto the roof and come down through a skylight and along some pipes. So remember to look up when we're thinking of rodents too. Don't just look down. Um, I've seen infestations of mice in pallets of goods that have been put about five, six racks up on top. And those mice are perfectly happy up there because again, it's, it's mostly undisturbed. They'll come out looking for food and then go right back up to that pallet that's, oh, 10, 20 feet up in the air that's been put up there. So don't forget to look up. That's really important. So remember that rule of thumb when you're looking to, you know, look from the inside to the outside or vice versa. And remember to look up even when you're in your facility. And, and we talk a little bit about standing water as well. Our rats need a daily source of water. They cannot survive without actually drinking. Mice, house mice, can actually get all the water that they need from their food. Now, if they have a water source, they're obviously going to take advantage of that. But cleaning up some of those water sources can also drive those rodents farther away from your facility, again, causing fewer problems in the future. Monitoring is great. Um, we have a lot of monitoring tools that we use. If you look around your facility, um, a, a lot of people don't realize that these tools are out there. They may just see this, this little tin box or this black box on the outside and have no idea what it's there for. Um, and we do have a video here. I'm hoping that we can, we can play this video here of a, of a rat on a, a bait box on the outside. Simon, do you think we can So what you saw there was a rat that was in a, in a bait box. So if you look outside your facility, many of you will see those black boxes on the outside of your facility, and those have rodent bait in them. And, and that one obviously had a clear top so that we could see what it was doing, but that's what happens. The rat, the rodent goes in there, eats some of the bait, goes back to its home, and, 
you know, is not impacting the inside of the facility. So those bait stations on the outside are placed very carefully. Um, if you notice them, you'll see the holes are up against the wall so that as that rodent likes to run up against the wall where it's safe, uh, they're gonna they're gonna encounter that bait box. They're gonna find that that nice tasty bait, and they're gonna get a little nibble of it, and and that's gonna be the end of that one. When you look inside, you may see those those little tin boxes up against the wall. Those are typically traps. Uh, not so great for rats, but great for mice. Uh, you may see snap traps. All of these things, uh, whether they're on the outside or on the inside, are again to intercept these rodents as quickly as possible. We know that, that the, one of the most common places that rodents are gonna get in is through doorways. So most of the places that you're gonna see these are right around doorways so that we can intercept them as quickly as they can come in. Hopefully we don't have a lot coming in, but we're gonna intercept them quickly so they don't get farther into that warehouse. They don't get farther into that processing area. They don't drop those 100 pellets per day of, of mouse poop um, around your facility. We wanna catch them fast. The other thing that does is it alerts us when there is a problem. Say we start to find a lot of feeding on one or two of those bait stations. We know that in that area, we're starting to see a problem, and maybe there's a sanitation issue in that area that we can fix. Maybe there's a water issue that, you know, there's an excess water source that they're, they're having a good time and, and having all the resources that they need in that situation. When we find a lot on a specific trap on the indoor, maybe we know that that door seal is broken and we can fix that door seal. Again, remember that rule of thumb. If you can fit your thumb through that opening, that, that mouse, that rat is gonna get in. So in a way, these are another set of eyes that we have in the facility that are sitting there working 24 seven. So again, letting the employees know what they're there for, that you know, if you pick one up to move it because you're sweeping the floor to put it back exactly where it should be. Um, do not use them to prop open the doors. Uh, <laughs> totally defeats the purpose because one, now you've propped open the door and you've taken the device away. And what we can do is, is get a report of this. How many are getting in? Which devices are they hitting? And again, to focus on those areas where they may be. These trend reports, this data that this is giving us gives us this early warning system of when problems are starting to occur. When we know that the problems are starting to occur, we can respond fast, we can respond to that particular species, and again, maybe find some of these sanitation issues that, that have been missed in previous inspections. Maybe find something new that a rodent has gnawed through a door seal that, that we hadn't seen in a week. Um, so all of these things are going to go to help us to, again, I'm going to say it again, I know I've said it a million times, but prevent these issues because we don't want the mice in there. We don't want the rats in there. We want to capture them right when they get in and we want to prevent them from even getting close to the facility with those devices on the outside. Um, another great thing about those bait stations and what you saw that that rat gnawing on that that bait is that if that's the only food source for them outside that knocks those populations down a lot quicker. So when you consider your outside areas that your employees may be using, your trash bins, your dumpsters, if you don't give them easy access to that they're gonna to go to the easier food source of that rodenticide bait, and that's gonna keep those populations nice and small on the outside, again, reducing the chance that they won't even get in to your facility in, the, in that, that aspect. And we've mentioned a, a number of times how this is a team effort. You may have a pest management professional, uh, that, that third party that comes in and checks these devices, sets up these devices. And again, not just for rodents, but for your other pests that are there. But it is a concerted effort with everybody at that facility. Everybody has a set of eyes that they can report. I think one of the best tools in any facility to have is a pest sighting log a log that all of your employees know where it is and know how to use it so that when they do see something, when they do see that rat running through the warehouse, 
when they do see that open skylight that could allow a rat in, they can report that. Um, and if it's reported quickly, it can be addressed quickly. And if it's addressed quickly, again, we don't have that rat coming in through that skylight because we've already solved that problem. So having that pest sighting log is a great tool. And again, if you have that third party coming in to do your pest management, they should be checking that every single time they get there. So when your employee reports that, hey, we saw a mouse running through aisle three of our warehouse, your professional is going to immediately go to aisle three, immediately start looking around that area and find out what's going on. There's also a lot of training that can go on with staff, even just quick trainings, um, hanging up a poster of, you know, your top three rodents to keep an eye out for um, and, and having a little fun with it. You know? Uh, you know, keep a lookout for these these evil pests or something like that. Um, but lots of good staff training, again, of, of what to look for, when you should look for it, and, and especially that reporting system. If your staff does not know who to report it to, where to report it to, that problem will continue. I guarantee it. I've seen it in a number of cases where I've talked to people and they've told me, oh, yeah, I, I've seen that you know, going on for two, three months now. And for two, three months now, that problem has gotten worse and worse and worse. So having that reporting system and everybody knowing how to use it is really important. Um, everybody's set of eyes are really great, so, so use them. It's, it's a great tool to have. And documentation, of course, is extremely important. Uh, I, I will admit nobody out there probably likes all this documentation, but this documentation is necessary. Uh, especially in the United States, we have a lot of different audit systems that we may be following, and if we don't write it down, it doesn't happen. Um, so we need to know every time a pest management professional was there. Uh, if you're doing this in-house every time that somebody walked around and did an inspection and checked your bait stations, every time somebody walked around and checked all your interior devices. And, and documenting those conducive conditions. When we say conducive conditions, we're talking about those sanitation issues. We're talking about those exclusion issues. Again, rule of thumb. Uh, fit your thumb through the hole, that means the rat can get in. And I think just as important too is if you can come up with um, those corrective actions. Uh, if I can fit my thumb through this hole in the wall and a rat can get in, well my corrective action should be to seal up that hole. Now maybe I need to get with maintenance to do that. I need to get with a different department. This is where communication is especially important to talk to these other departments about what you need and why you need it. Um, don't just throw a little bit of uh, you know, newspaper in that hole. Go ahead and fill that up with some cement so that it's solid and that rat can't chew through it. You should definitely have a map of where all of your devices are. Again, this may be rodent devices and other pest management devices, but that map helps out um, not just with, with an auditor who's going to come in and ask where all of them are, but for whoever is doing your actual service on a regular basis to ensure that they don't miss anything. And it can also help with that trend reporting. If you know where device 20 is, and you can look at a map and say device 20 is here, and device 20 has caught mice for four weeks in a row now, you can investigate that particular area. Also, of course, treatment data, very important to record what has been treated, what areas have been treated, what products have been used, uh, again, for reporting issues, and, and which pests you're looking at. Um, again, we don't just treat and throw down some, some pesticide. We want to know what we're using. We want to know what pest that's for. And again, those corrective actions go along with some of that treatment data as well. Sometimes the treatment is your corrective action. Sometimes you have additional corrective actions on top of that. So if my, my rule of thumb found that hole in the wall and we sealed it up with cement and we installed a couple extra bait stations on the outside just in case the rodents were using that as a pathway, all of those corrective actions, again, go to preventing that situation. And we've used our, our data from our monitoring devices to tell us, is that working? Is that not working? Uh, what can we do differently on that? 
because uh, very important when we talk about this IPM plan that it, it's not static. It shouldn't stay the same. Your facility is changing all the time. Conditions are changing all the time. So we need to take a look at that, especially once, at least once a year, to take a look at your IPM plan, take a look at your trending data, talk with your IPM professional if you have a third party doing that. Because again, there's a lot of audits that may be happening. You may be getting some external third party audits. You may be getting internal audits. Uh, there's one facility I, I was just at that they said that they go through 20 different audits every single year. That's, that's almost two audits a month. So between, between all these different audits that they, they need to do between suppliers and receivers and customers and, and third party, so we do have some audit prep uh, information. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, learning more about what you can do, uh, the website is there, um, some great resources there, um, as well as talking to your pest management professional if you have a third party doing it. Um, tell them absolutely which audits you, you need to go through, what those audit standards are, and, and ask your pest management professional what can we be doing better to to prepare for this, um, and they may have some suggestions since, again, they're there, they're another set of eyes for that. So obviously, um, we, we have some additional resources, uh, free educational materials, and your pest management professionals should be able to, to give you some training materials, some extra documentation, and really talk with them. I mean, that's, that's going to be the key, is, is talking with the folks that are doing this asking them what you can do better and telling them what they can do better. Um, in some cases, you may be seeing some things at your facility, whether that's processing or storage or whatever it is, and say, hey, you know, you haven't focused very much on this particular area. I need you to do a better job in that area this week because we're concerned about it. Talk to them because, again, that partnership makes this system work so much better. And that partnership, again, well, I'm going to say it one more time, prevents a lot of those issues. And, and that is the key with IPM. We want to try and do that. So um, with that, I think I've taken up just about most of my time here. Again, I want to thank all of you for being on this webinar. Um, uh, if you folks have any questions, um, I think we've got Simon back on. I'm going to just turn my webcam back on here. And I uh, would yeah. love to, to take some questions from the crowd if we've got them. Yeah, we've got some. That was great, that, uh, Shell. Uh, just one thing, uh, those rats in the, you know, in the video, yep. they were rats, they can really fit through a thumb-sized hole. Thumb -sized, yeah, if you hold up your thumb, your thumb, uh, in the United States, we say something about a quarter, but I know we've got a little international, so that size, their skull, their skull, when you look at a rat, their skull is not very big. So as long as they can fit their skull in, the rest of the fat little body will squeeze through that mm. hole. Yep. Well, it's almost got to be water airtight then, isn't it, the facility? You know, well, and when we think about insects, think of the, the tiny, tiny little cracks and crevices insects can fit through. Mm. So yes, the more airtight you can make your facility, the better. Obviously, that's impossible to make it totally hermetically sealed and never let anybody in or out. But the more that you can do, the more of those problems you, you can avert. Okay. Well, there are some questions. We've got some time, plenty of time. So let's get straight into those. Uh, Great. Uh, Megan Nafis, if you work in a ready-to-eat product plant, how often should you perform your own independent pest control checks if your pest control service provider does his inspection monthly? Okay, if they're doing it monthly, I would certainly have some type of weekly plan. Now, depending on how big your facility is, you may not be able to cover every single area once a week, but I would, I would schedule a weekly inspection plan that you hit most areas within a one month period so you can start to see that, especially if your professional is only there once a month. You really need those eyes and, and ears out there for the for the rest of the time. So use your employees that are out there and make sure you have that designated inspection schedule that one person or multiple people can be doing uh, when you're when your professional is not there during that month. Uh, and what you're looking for when you when you're wandering around? 
Well, uh, you know, whatever pests are native to your area. Obviously, we're focusing this this particular one on rodents. So I'm going to assume that you're in the United States. But we're going to look mostly for the Norway rats. If you are on the coast or in the southern U.S., you have the the potential for roof rats. But if you're in northern U.S. or in the central, it's going to be Norway rats, which are going to burrow, and it's going to be the house mouse. So what you're looking for is those pests, obviously. You're looking for any signs, especially on the outside, those burrows that the rats are going to make. You're going to look for those holes, um, especially if you can get down just a little bit low and look at that, that door seal, if you can see that daylight. And again, if that thumb can stick through there, look for all of those things. Um, that would be a good starting point. And again, I, I think we have some more resources online that will point out a few more things that you can look for but I think those would be the most obvious things that it that it pop out at you okay thank you we'll put links to those uh, resources in the follow-up email as well yeah. um, Lindsay Love uh, if an employee finds a dead pest on an incoming trailer does that need to be recorded in the pest sighting blog Absolutely. And, and in fact, um, not sure how every facility out there works, but if you've got an incoming load of goods and it has a dead pest in there, most facilities will reject that. Um, you have a contaminated good now, even if it's dead, um, especially if it's within a, a shrink wrap pallet or anything like that, um, that's cause for rejection. And absolutely, I would record that. Obviously, if the, the load's going to get rejected, it's going to get moved. But your pest management professional should know about that. Um, you need a record of that because if that supplier continues to send contaminated goods, um, you want that ongoing record of, of how that's happening, when that's happening, um, and, and to protect yourself knowing that it's not coming from your facility, it's actually coming from somewhere else. So that documentation is, is crucial. Okay, Erin uh, Peabody, should there be concern and records kept of any pests found in cafeteria stroke break room areas if they are clearly separated from the manufacturing area? Yeah, that's a great question because we tend to see a little bit different pests in those employee areas. We tend to uh, we tend to keep processing areas very very clean, which is great. We tend to forget about some of those employee locker rooms and kitchens and break rooms sometimes. So yes, we absolutely want to keep a record of that, and we absolutely want to form corrective actions for that because those pests, even though it is separate. Those pests can migrate. Those pests can get outside through that open door or potentially on an employee. Um, I had a situation once where we knew that um, employees were inadvertently bringing cockroaches on soft lunch bags, you know, those, those soft lunch pails. The facility actually um, ordered a, a hard cooler for every single employee, and employees were only allowed to bring their lunches in that hard cooler so they could not bring cockroaches from the outside. So yes, that stuff in those employee areas needs to be needs to be treated, it needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be recorded. So we can figure out that we can isolate it here, we can keep it under control here, and not let it move to those processing areas. Great question on that one. Okay, um, Leo, I'm not sure the 100% relevance, but can, can we use detergents in sanitation? That your field are are not. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, just sorry, Simon, you broke up a little bit at the end of that. Um, but sanitation oh, is an important, and so um, cleaning products can help a lot. Especially, um, we have some cleaning products that can actually um, start to break down some of the fats and the oils, um, uh, especially around outside dumpsters. If you have these areas that you can break down that that buildup of grime that is happening there. So um, check with your cleaning company. Um, again, a lot of people have a, a third party that provides a lot of their cleaning companies. And check with your pest management company. They may have some specific recommendations of specific products that may work better in one area versus another area for specific paths. So yeah, good question. Okay, uh, Roberto, what should I do if there are rodents inside a drywall? Oh, um, <laughs> 
Well, number one, good luck. Um, this is not going to be an easy situation to deal with. Um, chances are you are going to have to get into that drywall. Um, I don't know your particular situation, so I can't, uh, you know, give you the the perfect solution to this. But um, chances are you're going to need to to get in there because it sounds like at this point they may be nesting in there. So they found their way in. They're reproducing within that space. So once you get that cleaned out, and once you get that that particular problem alleviated, tracing that back to how they got in, uh, if possible, and sealing off those areas, and potentially putting up a, a different type of wall material other than dry board. So again, a, a great question to have somebody come in and take, a, a professional come in and take a look and provide some, some, uh, some specific uh, solutions to that particular one. But that, I, I will admit that that's going to take a little bit of work and effort from what it sounds like. Okay, you couldn't just, I mean, this might be a silly question, but you couldn't just put poison down and let them take it back to the nest and kill all them in the drywall. Yeah, that's a, it's not a silly question. Um, so we, we do have rodenticides. Um, we tend to not use rodenticides inside any type of food processing just because of the the potential for contamination. Um, there are situations where on rare occasion we may use a rodenticide to do something similar to that, um, but especially when you've got a drywall situation like that and you've got that, that void, that space in between, um, is that space always going to be there? Um, will that wall eventually be knocked down? And if so, um, you know, what worker protections might you need? Um, could there be contamination then? So we are very hesitant to use any type of rodenticide on the inside of a facility. But I won't say that it that it's never happened. It, it could mm. be a solution in this particular one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ian Reader. Would you recommend rotating the active ingredient ingredient annually for baiting to prevent resistance buildup? Absolutely. Thank you for that one. Um, we, we absolutely want to rotate our baits and not just for the active ingredient, um, but you can kind of think of it this way. I mentioned chocolate chip cookies earlier. I love chocolate chip cookies, but if I have to eat chocolate chip cookies for a year, I might start to get sick of chocolate chip cookies and want to switch to oatmeal raisin cookies. So it's not just the active ingredient in that bait, but it's also the bait matrix. It's, it's the food matrix that's holding that active ingredient. So so yes, we want to switch up those baits for those two reasons. One for the resistance, but also the um, not the resistance, but so much the aversion of me going. I don't want to eat chocolate chip cookies anymore. I'm not going to go there. Um, so to to switch up the aversion to that bait as well as not presenting prevent that not doing that whole resistance thing to the active ingredient. Yeah, as they say, variety is the spice of life. For rats and mice as well as us humans. <laughs> uh, Anna Ku, is there a certain threshold that are allowed? I have seen some contracts that say threshold max of one mice mouse is allowed or three cockroaches allowed. Uh, that is often up to the facility, sometimes the industry and sometimes the product. Um, in the United States, we have certain products that have government allowable thresholds. So if you think of um, a bag of cherry, a, a jar of cherries that says no pits in these cherries, obviously, you know, something's going to slip through and maybe one of those cherries has a pit in it. So there are certain products that have allowable thresholds in the United States, but that's something to check into with the individual product, with your company, and with your industry of what those thresholds may be. Mm -hmm. um, Mariana, uh, what type of baits can be used inside considering chemical cross-contamination? Well, and that's the issue. Um, in the United States, none of our baits actually um, have a restriction that they cannot be used inside. But as an industry standard, we almost never do just because of the potential for any type of cross-contamination. So what I always encourage people to do um, is to read the label. The label, as, as kitschy as this sounds, in the United States, the label is the law. So you must follow that. 
Um, so, and, and make a decision based on, on your facility. If, if you really do have a need and it is a situation where your pest management professional and everybody has decided that we can use this safely here and the label allows for it, that is a situation. But again, as an industry standard, most of the time we will not use any toxic rodenticide on the inside of a facility. Okay. Has that changed? Did, did, is that always been the case? Or has that changed? Oh, um, I'd have to go way back in the labels, um, but but at least for the last ten years, um, our, our rodenticide labels do not strictly prohibit inside baiting. It's just the industry standard. Okay. And Francis, uh, what about steel wool in access holes before sealing? Yeah, um, so it depends on what you're uh, you're ultimately sealing with. Rats can chew through steel wool, um, so if you're just putting a, a, a wad of steel wool in that hole and and hoping that that's going to do it, um, no, not going to do it. Uh, one of the products that we have that we like to use a lot in in the U.S. is a copper mesh. Uh, the rodents can't get through that copper mesh, and so um, we can use that to stuff in holes and then ultimately seal around. There's a number of products that are specifically geared towards rodents and rodents not being able to gnaw through that material. So again, I think that's a great conversation to have with a, a pest management professional. Okay, Leo says I love your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> um, Moshi, is there any way to stop rodents from coming in through open loading docks? No. <laughs> I, I wish I had something more on that, but that's a big hole. <laughs> if you big hole. Opening for them, they will take advantage of it. Um, what, what was the movie? If you build it, they will come. If you leave it open, they will come. Um, well, is, there, is there anything they don't like, though, rats? Is there anything that the uh, you know that really ugh, let's not go anywhere near that? I, nothing that I've really found. Um, one of the things I have found with those open loading dock doors, a lot of people will leave the the doors open because they want that airflow. It gets hot. They need a breeze or something like that. There's a lot of um, screen doors that you can use. That um, even though the the actual dock door is open that screen door can come down and still allow that airflow. But if you leave a door open, if you leave an opening for them, they will absolutely utilize that. I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer, but nope. Mm. Okay, uh, Thiru Varanga, should a food preparation stroke storage facility have controls and inspection for roof rats as well? If you are in an area that has roof rats, Absolutely. Again, in some areas of the United States, we don't have a chance of roof rats. It's it's too far north um, or it's too central to the United States where roof rats just don't live. Um, but yes, if for any pest that you have, you should have an inspection protocol for that. So if roof rats are native to your area, absolutely make sure you're looking up as much as you are looking down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, update. Uh, I think the question is, when can we use chemicals inside manufacturing? Again, read the label. Um, again, just speaking from, from a United States aspect, um, it's something that we will do very, very rarely um, and under just very certain circumstances that it, it's not anything specific that this time we will. It, it's done on an as-needed basis that a lot of discussion has happened and it's it, it's by the site. So again, that's the conversation to have on your specific site, on your specific problem um, with your with your professional. Okay. And, and uh, I think we've mentioned before, uh, it's, it's a good idea once in a while to walk around with the pest control. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Talk with them. Yeah. yeah. Ask them questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Abdi again, uh, when must we change the plan, pest control plan? Oh, that's a great question. So you should be looking at your IPM plan at least once a year or when something significant has changed. So say like you've added on to your building and you've added a, an extra processing room or you've ripped out an entire processing line and brought in new equipment. Anytime something significant changes, 
Um, it's say even weather related. Say you had a huge flood and for a month your facility was flooded. Um, all of these things would, would indicate that you should look at your pest management plan and adapt it as needed, but at a minimum once per year. Okay, thank you. And uh, Robert, in what kind of areas can a food plant be divided to locate traps? Are there colors for each area? Yeah, so again, it depends on your facility. Um, I, I would look at you know a, a floor plan, a map of your particular facility, and, and maybe you have some different areas of your facility that you consider for whichever pest problem, high pressure, low pressure, um, thresholds maybe a little bit higher for this area, lower for that area. So that would be facility independent. And again, you, you know, a professional that can come in and take a look at your areas, they can help you with that. Okay. Uh, Anders, where are the best locations for exterior bait stations? We place them beside doorways, but we've heard every 50 feet around the exterior of the building is the way to go. Yeah, so uh, a while back in the United States, um, some of our audit standards said you should have a bait station every so many feet. What we have developed now is a much better understanding of IPM and using things as needed. So your bait stations should be placed as needed. Um, if you're placing bait stations every 50 feet and you check them once a month and the bait hasn't been consumed at all, you probably have really low pressure there, so you don't need all those bait stations. So you could remove half of them, a third of them. Um, if you're gonna put them near doors, I would just make sure they're not right next to that door. You know, if the door is here, making sure they're not right up against the door. Place them about five to 10 feet away because you don't wanna draw that rodent to that door directly. You wanna draw it more towards the bait station. So use your trending data of how much bait has been eaten and then determine, you may need more bait stations on say the north side of your facility or less on the south side. Your trending data of how much bait has been consumed will lead you into that right direction. And, and you can save, again, save some time and effort on the areas you know there aren't very much pressure, there aren't very many rats, and spend your time on those areas where there are more rats. Okay, Melinda's just made a comment. Arkin has a very good gunk remover called Actizyme. It works wonders. It does. That's one of our, our cleaning products. And, and I mentioned some of those biological cleaners that can that literally have, have little microbiomes in that, that that literally start to break down and decompose a lot of the the gunk, thank you for that that word, I love it. Um, so there, there's definitely some of those out there, and again, for, for different situations, we may have some different solutions for that, but but thank you for that, it, it is a great product. Okay, uh, let's see if I've been listening. Fernando's asking, can we use lethal rodent products inside facility? I would say, ideally not, but never say never, uh, you need to do a risk assessment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maria, um, Maria uh, is it recommended to use a UV lamp to detect urine of rodents in warehouses that may have potential inf infestation? Yeah, so black lights can be, can be very helpful, um, especially if you're trying to find pathways. Uh, we actually have a, a special bait that has something called Lumatrax in it, so when the rodents eat it, uh, when they leave their droppings behind, they fluoresce under a black light, so you can kind of see those pathways. Um, so UV flashlights can be um, a good tool. Just realize that there are a lot of other things that can fluoresce under a black light. So it, it can give you some good data, but it can also give you some false positives as well. So like any tool, it's not perfect. Okay, James Delamere, what are the quickest ways to overcome rats? neophobic tendencies when trying to capture the rat. Oh, good one. So yeah, we didn't talk too much about this, that, that rats are neophobic. They're a little bit afraid when new stuff shows up. 
Um, so one of the best ways to overcome that is, is actually to prebate traps, um, to leave those devices there, um, especially if it's something like a snap trap or something like that. Leave it there, but don't, don't set it. Let the rat come up, let, let the rat you know, eat a little bit of the bait, run away, get it comfortable with going to that device for about three to four days. And once you can do that, then you can actually set the trap because now they've gotten over that, that fear of something new because it's no longer new. Um, bait stations, again, same kind of general principle. A lot of times uh, some people put traps in bait stations as well as bait. Uh, leave that trap there, but don't leave it set. And, uh, and again, maybe some, some different types of bait, um, a, a non-toxic bait in there first, something that that they like to feed on, get them used to feeding on it, and then switch up to, to that toxic rodenticide. So great, great question about the, the neophobia. That was awesome. I've never heard that word before. Um, Ash, Akshay, in spite of safe premises and maintaining third party agency for rodent control, what else measures should we take to control rodents or are the mentioned precautions sufficient? Um, I, I think it's looking at your whole plan. Um, obviously, even with a third party, you still have a, a role in that to keep your eyes open, all of the employees' eyes open. So I, I think the only thing that, that I'd add to what we've already talked about is, is just continuous training. Even if that's five, ten minute um, trainings of a reminder of what to look for, a reminder of where the pest sighting log is, a new poster hung up in the locker room, that continuous training to remind people of, of what to look for as they're out there to help with that program. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, Megan, if a third party pest control provider uses a pesticide that is not on the approved chemical list they provide to help handle a pest issue, what should we do? Oh, that's something that you need to take up with your pest control company. Um, you know, we have these approved lists for a reason, um, and the the list, just like your IPM uh, plan, should not be set in stone. But until exceptions are made and signed off on, that approved product list is that approved product list. So that is something you will need to take up with with that company and discuss with them what options there are and what they are going to do about that. Okay, just a couple more questions, I think. Maurizio, what are new tools for rodent population control are you using in the USA biological control? Oh, um, not so, so sure about anything new. Um, one of the things that, that is starting to uh, kind of catch on is we're looking at remote monitoring systems. So we have traps and devices that if a rodent goes in and sets off the trap, it sends an alert to my cell phone and I can bring up my cell phone and say, oh, trap three now has a capture. Um, so this is something that, that is starting out, obviously, because it's starting, it is a lot more expensive than traditional rodent control, but um, it definitely has some advantages and, and disadvantages like any tool. Um, but, you know, the, the traps, the bait stations, all of that is, is pretty standard. Um, hasn't, hasn't changed too much. I think it's more our understanding and our use of these tools. We're using these tools a lot better. Like the question about the bait stations is, should we have them every 50 feet? Well, no. Um, we understand that the rodent pressure here is less than over here. So our use of these tools has gotten a lot better. Okay, Abdi, what's the best type of bait for inside the manufacturing plant? <laughs> Well, I mean, if, if you're going to use, uh, you know, if we're talking about um, baiting on traps, you know, with, with a food bait versus a non-toxic, um, you one of two things, either use something that they're already feeding on. Um, I was just in a location that um, we had a rat issue and they were going crazy over the chocolate. They were ignoring everything else in this facility, but they liked the chocolate. So we baited the traps with chocolate um, and we had great success in, in catching them. Um, indoors, you can also use non-toxic uh, bait blocks. Uh, in the United States, we have something called DTAX, which is a non-toxic one, which again, um, with the Lumatrax, um, makes their, makes their drop, droppings fluoresce. So you can use that inside, um, again, carefully and cautiously, but to point you in the right direction of where some of those issues are so you can search out some root causes and fix those. Just another 
quite high. Is it uh, possible to, you know, oh, what they call now? I forgot. To stop them <laughs> reproducing what they called? Is yeah. So, <laughs> um, there are companies that are are looking at um, essentially what what might amount to birth control for rodents. Oh, um, uh, it hasn't been especially successful wide scale yet. Um, but you know we're always looking to the future and what what new technologies and, and what new products may be out there. Um, just like anything, some of them may be successful and some of them may not. So uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Birth control, yes. Uh, Bill, <laughs> what is the maximum row denticide amount in grams should be used in a bait? Uh, that would depend on the individual bait. So again, read the label, and the label will tell you the maximum amount that you can use. Um, right, I think. Uh, uh, oh, Ivan, um, sorry, I joined late. Are there rodent deterrence measures that work, such as ultrasound, smells, etc.? Ah, oh, great question, because there are a lot of those products out there. I I walked into my my local home store uh, not too long ago and saw those ultrasound devices. Um, there's actually scientific proof that they do not work. Um, I always liken it to the fact that I really don't like country music. I hate country music, but if I'm hungry and there's pizza, I'm going to deal with the country music so I can get to the pizza. Um, so unfortunately, those sound deterrents absolutely positively do not work for rodents. Um, the, the smell deterrents can have a slight impact. Unfortunately, what happens in many of our food facilities, we have such a good food smell coming out of them that it basically overpowers the exclusion smell that's trying to keep them away. So really from a, a standpoint of, of anything other than a physical exclusion does not work great right against rodents. I can tell you, Ivan, mosquitoes don't like lemon. <laughs> um, I found that out in uh, Mallorca last year. Um, <laughs> bless you. Uh, does a cha change of layout necessarily trigger a review of the pest control plan? I think it should. Um, if it's a small layout change, like you moved, um, you know, a employee table from one side of the room to the other, probably not. But judge that on, on to how, how big of a change you think it was and how big of an impact you think it might have. If you believe it's a small change and really won't have an impact, you're fine. Okay. We really are coming to the end now. We've, I mean, we've run over, but, you know, you've got to answer the question. That's great. No. Enrique, are PMC verifications every month frequent enough? <clears throat> um, depends on your facility. Yeah, um, I, I think for for food processing, you probably want something a little bit more often. If you're merely a storage warehouse site um, and, and you have good in-house inspections and sanitation schedules, that may be enough. But um, I, I would judge that on your facility. Okay, and I think for now the final one, uh, Mahendra. Uh, What's the best road denticide to be used in the for outdoor based bait stations? Well, like we talked a little bit about, um, bait rotation is extremely important. Uh, personally, uh, there are a couple good soft rodenticides. Um, there are the block rodenticides that are kind of a, a paraffin block type deal. And there are some soft baits, which are much more palatable. So I tend to start with those soft baits, um, especially if it's a new account or we have higher pressure because well, I'd rather eat something tastier than something not so tasty. Um, but as long as you're rotating those baits on a regular basis, at least yearly, um, all of the active ingredients are, are going to do a good job. It's, it's more just that bait matrix, that food portion of that, that may make it slightly tastier or not so tasty. Okay. Uh, just f finally, it, um, so I, I'm a food safety manager in a food plant. What should I be asking my pest controller, you know, um, to address these issues? You know, what what things should I be asking them to do or look at or help me with? 
Sure. Um, you know, they should be following your IPM plan. So, so that should already be out there. So some of the additional questions I would say is, you know, tell me where my hot spots are. Tell me where things are starting to get higher numbers, higher populations so that I can go check that out. Um, and I would be asking them, uh, you know, I would be asking them, are there any areas you have not been able to access? Because let's be honest, some of these facilities are big, there are locked rooms and people get busy. Those areas that, that they cannot access that get missed on a regular basis are where issues can really, really develop. So I think those would be two great questions to start with. Number one, where are my hot spots that I need to keep an eye out and where have you not been able to access that I can help you with that? Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Sure. Uh, that's super. That I really enjoyed it. Did you, Cheryl? I, I did. You folks had some amazing questions. This was so yeah. much fun. Yeah, it's brilliant. I really enjoyed that. So thanks to the audience. Thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today and participating and making it such an engaging webinar. Fun. Yeah, I had <laughs> yeah. fun. <laughs> Great. All right then. Uh, nice to have you with us today, Cheryl. I'll, I'll follow up with the audience later with the recording, the slides, and I'll put those links in, uh, the hyperlinks to the extra resources on the Orkin website. So, excellent. Thanks very much, Yao. Thank you, folks. Have a good one. Thanks. Okay, ladies and gents, that's it. We're finished. Thank you again for today, uh, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Take care, everyone. Bye. Have a nice day.